So, so an agent such as this, I could see two different potential positionings for it. One is as one of the highly active agents, such as natalizumab, alemtizumab, ocrelizumab, or one of the orals, it may be top of the orals. So what do you think, positioning? It's a difficult question because <clears throat> the efficacy looks robust. The question ultimately is, is this an induction treatment? It has the flavor to some degree of depleting out your uh, immune cells and then having a different functioning immune system come back, which is kind of our definition to some degree of what a induction treatment would be. So I like that idea, particularly for this compound. Then the other side to that is what are the safety concerns? How are we gonna monitor these patients? What is the, you know, the next agent if somebody breaks through? Is there any concern for the sequencing of drugs? And that's really what it's gonna come down to. And so far, based on the data that was available in 2010, and now that we have follow-up extension data, there really wasn't a huge safety concern that came out. I mean, you know, there was a concern for possible malignancies. And, you know, you look at all the drugs that we're using these days, they all have a little bit of that going on. So I don't know that it's going to distinguish anything. So it may end up being just another really good, high-efficacy drug with a fairly uh, benign mechanistic uh, take a couple of pills for a week and another month later you take another and you don't really have to keep doing that. I think it's very attractive. Where we will learn more is what are the, you know, concerns if somebody's breaking through on that, and where do you go at that point? What's your next option safety-wise that you could put somebody on without a concern? So I think we're gonna have to have four tiers. Uh, I would say that uh, we have sort of the, uh, the orals, at like a second tier of the injectables, and arguably, uh, depending on how people look at it, uh, a teraflunamide in, in the first tier. Second tier would be the orals outside of teraflunamide, Third tier uh, would be cladribine, and fourth tier would be the uh, infusion agents. Uh, of course, you know, part of what makes this very hard is we don't have a lot of head-to-head -head data uh, sometimes to make, uh, you know, to fully establish this, but based on sort of the pivotal trials, we make our best guess. And, and so I, I think ultimately the answer is the efficacy is uh, between the orals and, and, uh, and the infusions. Um, in term, I think one, uh, uh, these comments are not asynchronous with what's been said, but I, I think a concern that I have is um, uh, with all of, I think arguably all of the agents, uh, uh, when you give the drug, uh, MS can uh, recur. That's, that's for sure. I mean, we saw this with cyclophosphamide, which is, I would argue, a stronger drug than uh, cladramine, mechanistically, admittedly, a little different. Uh, but, you know, if you follow these patients forward long enough, uh, even after giving them a good slug of cyclophosphamide, you'd see that the disease uh, comes back. And um, um, so I think it's a matter of time and, and also uh, interplays with the uh, overall disease severity of the patient. But I think it would be a mistake to say, you know, we're giving two courses of uh, uh, cladribine and, and we're taking care of the patient's MS. Uh, of course, you'd want to continue to monitor them. But I think another hard part about continuing to monitor them is... Um, are you waiting until you have a new uh, change on the MRI Is, and, and they've had damage in the meantime? And so um, having said that, I think that this is a drug that uh, the safety profile looks good. Uh, it seems pretty tolerable. I think another interesting little feature is that uh, uh, there are some patients that uh, will lose oligoclonal bands when they're treated with uh, uh, cladribine. So what is that uh, mechanistically doing? That's sort of an interesting thing to wonder. So I think it's, it'll be nice to have this uh, new addition for sure. So I'm not a big fan of, uh, of tiering at all. To me, the interest in cladribin is that it's an oral induction agent. So you clearly use it, and uh, it had very good data used early at the time of CIS, and you seem to have a prolonged effect. Can you have a sustained drug-free period, or can you change the course of MS? Could you use this um, induction therapy very early on at the time of CIS and, uh, and convert an active MS to a much milder form of MS that then uh, could be treated very well with 
very, very safe, easy to take therapies. So I'd like to see data on how long does the effect last and some data suggesting whether you can change the, the course early on of what appears to be aggressive MS and will it then, then respond to other agents. To me, that would make it intellectually a very attractive agent to use. Uh, to me, the attraction of cladibrin is the uh, convenience of use. And in addition to that, and this is more of an economic question, is you know, cost of treatment may be theoretically less than with comparable drugs, in addition to what have already been said. So, Tom, in, in the Clarity extension, were there any hints or markers of the durability other than the clinical outcomes? White count or something like that? No, uh, in general, uh, that's a very interesting question. I mean, in general, the white cell count didn't, co even in the Clarity study, did not correlate with the disease attenuation in individual patients. So stratifying the patients of, on the level of lymphocyte reductions that they experienced, that didn't correlate with the disease activity. So uh, I agree with, with, with what's being said. Obviously, uh, our patients will have new disease activity at some point in time. And so how we recognize these patients is going to be an important uh, question. So, this, for example, the question is in such patients, neurofilament light would be a monitoring tool uh, that indicates more subtle disease reoccurrence. Uh, so, this certainly will need to be looked at. Also, keeps to in mind that obviously different individuals may need different dose or repeat dosing of these agents. Uh, of this agent, I mean. Um, just to keep in mind that individuals may have an immunologic response in multiple sclerosis that may be more or less accessible uh, to an oral treatment uh, dependent on, on how, I'm using a word deep, the uh, immune aberration is already present, whether it's present within the central nervous system to a larger degree, whether it's present perhaps in, in areas that are less reachable.